I'm meteorologist Rod Hill, and this KGW Plus special segment is based on the hurricane season, which doesn't overly impact us directly, but we can be pulled into the tropical moisture. I'll talk more about that coming up. Hurricane season, of course, June 1, just started, to November 30th. And we begin with kind of a double take. I'm Rod Hill. This is Rod Hill. I thought this would be fun to share with you. Uh, my very first job in television as a meteorologist was at Channel 25 in Victoria, Texas, back in 1989. So that's me with dark hair and, and kind of high hair. So in Texas in those days, long before the computer age, really, um, TV stations printed out hurricane tracking maps, and they had their logos and their meteorologists on the tracking maps. And when you went to the grocery store and checked out, there would be those tracking maps and you would pick up your tracking map as you bought your groceries and you would go home and the meteorologist would always put the Latin longitude coordinates on the screen and folks would literally track the storms at home because of course in Texas and the Gulf Coast and Florida, tracking storms is a big deal for safety. You wanna know where these things are going, right? So I thought that would be fun to share with you. That's me back in 1989. I know, nothing to look at then and Less to look at now. All right, here's a look at our uh, hurricane season name list for the tropical Atlantic Basin this year, put out by NOAA and the National Weather Service, the Hurricane Center. Andrea's number one this year, the first name. They always go alphabetized, if you didn't, if you didn't know. Uh, and then they always go from male, female. They alternate. So there's Barry, Chantel, there's Dexter, there's Aaron. Um, there's Jerry and Karen in the middle, Rebecca, no Rodney or Rod this year. Wendy wraps up with the W. So if your name is there, it's a big year for you, right? So there is the list of names that you'll be hearing in the news. Okay. What this graphic shows you also from NOAA is that their projection for a cast for how much activity they're putting at 60%. Now, what are they saying? They're saying there will be anywhere from 13 to 19 named storms in the Atlantic Basin this year. And by named storms, so you remember you just have thunderstorms, you've got kind of a some tropical circulation, a depression. And then if the circulation becomes organized and clocked in the center at 39 miles per hour or greater, it becomes a named storm, a tropical storm. And then out of those 13 to 16, or excuse me, 13 to 19 storms, Hurricane Center is saying, well, six to 10 of those will reach 74 mile per hour winds in the center around the eye wall and become hurricanes, okay? And then out of those, three to six of the hurricanes will become category three, four, or five storms classified as major hurricanes. Now, it's interesting to note that this particular summer season, not only for hurricane forecasting, but also in the Northwest, is what we call a neutral ENSO cycle year. Remember when I do my winter outlook, I focus heavily on, is it gonna be a La Nina winter, an El Nino winter, or a neutral? Well, we went neutral back in January, and we'll be in neutral conditions through the summer. So the Hurricane Center attaches a, a strong correlation to the fact that El Nino summer, early into fall seasons, typically produce the quietest hurricane centers because El Nino setups typically produce wind shear aloft that in the, in the basin of the hurricane development actually prohibits hurricane from getting strong or developing because of wind shear ripping things apart. La Nina seasons are the opposite. Uh, not much shear, and you often have the biggest hurricane or tropical numbers. And then neutral's kind of in the middle, hedging normal to above. So the climate average for hurricanes in today's world, in the Atlantic, is basically these first numbers, 13 named storms, six hurricanes, three major hurricanes. So the Hurricane Center is saying we're at least gonna be average to above, and those are the numbers that they are putting out. Now, as I'm sure you realize, hurricanes are very tightly associated with developing over warm tropical ocean temperatures, all right? So I grabbed this temperature map of ocean basins just yesterday, um, on, um, on Tuesday. So already, look at the 80 degree temperatures, and not that this is overly unusual, but uh, I don't look at this carefully enough to know if this is high for this time of the year or not, to be honest. But we see the purples, you can see the 80 degree temperatures coming off the coast of Africa, and out. this is down toward the equator, so not shocking. 80 degree temperatures down off the coast of southern Mexico, and then all out, and then on outward. 
Notice the yellow, that's 50 degree temperatures off the coast of Oregon and Washington, which by the way does not change much. We have 50 degree temperatures winter and summer out in the Pacific waters. That's why it's not that type of a beach, right? You don't typically go there to be warm and, and to sunbathe. Um, but the yellow arrows show you the path of the developing storm. So the ones that we fear most to have the best chance to become strong category four and five hurricanes are the ones that actually start as unsettled areas of thunderstorm activity off of the, off, uh, over the African continent and then migrate out over the open Atlantic and then gain circulation and become named storms and become hurricanes. If that happens, now these storms potentially have well over a week to even as much as two weeks to spin and gain strength. And that's why this can be the, the, the breeding ground for some of our worst hurricanes by the time they get out here and, and either threaten parts of the Caribbean or Mexico or the United States. Once they get here, uh, if the path is north of the Dominican Republic and the Antilles Islands and all of that, then these storms, not always, but statistically most often, will curve northward into cooler waters off of the U.S. mainland and not really hit the U.S., if they're down closer to the Lesser Antilles Islands and Cuba, they have a better chance of maybe hitting the U.S. mainland in the southeast in the Carolinas or Florida. Now, the second arrow, and I think this will be a growing concern as we continue to see a warming climate and warming water temperatures with that, is that, you know, we're getting into these now mid to late summers. All of a sudden you see 90 degree plus, even 95 degree water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, extremely bathy. That will favor development right in the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico of tropical systems that could rapidly explode. Let's say this, the storm gets named on a Thursday and by the time Saturday or Sunday rolls around, you have a hurricane that's marching inland into Texas, Florida or the Gulf Coast. That could be something that's a growing concern because these water temperatures really warm. Now off of the coast in the Pacific now, you've got storms that develop off the coast of Mexico and then usually will, will turn and move out. Of course, there's the Hawaiian Islands right there for potential development. Um, we've had storms where the outer rain belts have been so far north that it has been somewhat impactful into California, but not really up where we are. And it, there would have to be tremendous climate change for us to get in the risk area. Right now we're nowhere near it because of our colder water temperatures. We, I've got one more graphic to show you and then we're going to get some video. But let's look at this graphic in a moment. So there's a lot of talk of that windstorm we had had a hurricane force winds, right? If, you, if you're, uh, you're a native, you've heard us say that. We track these big cyclonic low pressure systems out in the Pacific. The strongest storms that we get typically not during summer, but they can be during the end of the hurricane season. Columbus Day storm in October of 1962, that's a hurricane season, right? The most infamous um, photo of that storm was this one. This is on what is now referred to as Western Oregon University down in Monmouth, and that's Campbell Hall, and that's the, the steeple being ripped off because of the strong winds. And so I, I was alive, but I wasn't forecasting at that time. I was here in, Port, in Portland forecasting the great gale of December of 2007, the great coastal gale. And I remember the storm vividly. The computer modeling handled it really well. I mean, a week out, we were tracking this thing and saying, be prepared for winds that would knock out power. We had parts of Tillamook County without power for weeks, for example. Highway 26, I think, was closed for multiple weeks and parts because of so many trees snapped off. This was on the four mile post marker inland on Highway 26 outside of Seaside. And those are trees that were just snapped off because of the intense winds. Bay City and Tillamook County had a wind gust of 120 miles per hour. Now that same windstorm along the coast we only had 40 mile per hour wind gusts mostly in the Lama Valley. The track of it was offshore enough that the valley didn't get it, but the coast did. And it was that same storm, you may remember this, that produced that Vernonia flood in December of 2007 with rain totals in the coast range that filtered into the, the, the uh, Nehalem River Basin, which is what flooded Vernonia. 10 to 15 inches of rain came down. It was absolutely crazy. We do have two pieces of video now. Let's roll video number one. This is uh, archived film video from the Columbus Day storm of 1962. Now remember, this is considered still to be the biggest windstorm, biggest low pressure system to ever take direct impact inland into the Willamette Valley in recorded history uh, from much of the valley all the way up into Portland and, and southwest Washington. You see all the wind damage. Remember 1962, you're just getting into the earliest years of satellite technology. So there wasn't the information that something was coming like we would see today. Wow. 
Now let's go to the more recent 2007, what's called the uh, Great Coastal uh, Gale Storm. A lot of heavy rain and wind. Again, we had the winds over 100 miles per hour at the coast. There's a shot of those trees falling along Highway 26. Our, uh, at the time, KGW's Pat Doris did a live report of all the trees that were down uh, over Highway 26. It was really something to watch as well. So from that, I want to end on this graphic. You often hear, that storm had hurricane force winds. And as a meteorologist, I've always cringed a little bit, and I'll tell you why when I hear that. So remember, hurricane wind classifications are based on sustained one-minute wind speeds, not gusts. So to be a Category 1 storm, we're talking about sustained winds around the eye wall of the storm, right, the center of it, sustained between 74 and 95 miles per hour. Now, some of our biggest Pacific lows have, in fact, produced sustained wind speeds up into the 70 plus mile per hour range, which would be, if you just look at the barometric pressure, and if you just look at the wind speed, the strength of a category one storm. Now, those same storms, don't, not that I am aware of, have not produced 96 or 111 sustained winds, but they have produced wind gusts approaching 130 miles per hour. So that's where that, that was like a category three hurricane. I get it, but keep in mind, we're talking about gusts, not sustained winds. Thank goodness. So I hope you found all of this somewhat informative. Uh, it was, hurricane, before I close, it was a tropical connection, what at one time was Typhoon Frida. It was that remnants of that moisture that became the massive low that became the Columbus Day Storm of 1962. So we do watch these plumes of tropical moisture that can develop into just regular massive low cyclones that can produce that type of damage here in the Northwest. I'm meteorologist Rod Hill. Thanks for watching.